Aren't baptisms amazing to watch? Yeah, at least like six of us think that. That's great. No, just kidding. Yeah. No, it's so good. You know, and it's so funny because a lot of times people are like, how do you know like as a church, like you're actually being the church? And a lot of churches today, they come up with all sorts of things, you know, like how many people attend or how much money they give or, uh, you know, maybe it's like following a liturgy a particular way or like whatever it is. Like that's what, you know, what we're supposed to do. And for me, um, this is probably like one of the greatest things that's a symbol of, of us doing what we're supposed to do, right? Um, because what we, what we participate in when we see baptism is uh, a story being told. And one of the things we care about more than anything else at Summit is telling the story of people's lives who are changed by the story and the message of Jesus. And so for every single person this morning, that's kind of what we saw, right? That's like what's going on is like it's a story of somebody's trajectory, their story heading in a particular direction and their life being changed by Jesus. And that's really what this is all about. Um, that really contributes to a lot of what we do. When you think about like, why do we gather as a church and why do we do the things that we do? It really is this whole idea of like, how are our lives, how can our lives be transformed by Jesus? Like, how does this really happen for us? And so the things that we do, whether it's on a Sunday or something else that happens during the week around here or something that happens in homes, ultimately that's what we're looking for is like, how can our lives be transformed more and more by the story of Jesus? Um, it's fascinating because as we um, look at the scripture that we're looking at today, we actually see the transformation, how it like expanded, how people's lives were continually being changed by this message of Jesus. Um, for those of you that maybe haven't been here with us, um, we're walking through a New Testament book called Acts. And uh, we've been doing it for a couple of months. And the book of Acts is actually the first book that follows the biographies of Jesus in the New Testament. So you know, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the biographies called the Gospels of Jesus. And then um, if you've ever wondered like, okay, so what happened? Like Jesus is resurrected. So then what takes place next? That's exactly where the book of Acts picks up is it tells that story of what happens after the resurrection. In fact, um, the first few verses of the book of Acts, there's this overlap where Jesus is still hanging out with his disciples. And so it begins to tell this story. And as we look at this story, it's really beautiful and amazing because not only does it tell us like the historical narrative of like how the church started and how it went from place to place, but it also tells the story of where we came from. In fact, there's this one verse Acts chapter 1 verse 8 we looked at it the very first week that we started this series where Jesus is standing with his disciples and he says this he says you'll receive power when my Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the ends of the earth and we saw like the first week like there's this thing that happens called Pentecost and the church is birthed in the city of Jerusalem and then we see the church going from there into Judea, the area surrounding Jerusalem, like sort of the province that Jerusalem was in. And then Samaria was that next region kind of butting up against Judea. And then the gospel starts to go into the uttermost parts of the earth or the end of the earth as Luke describes it in Acts chapter 1. Um, that's an interesting season. And that's actually a season we started looking at a few weeks ago where the apostle Paul was sent out by a church in a city called Antioch, which is north of Jerusalem. And he went out the first time with a guy named Barnabas and the two of them traveled all over the Roman empire. And they told people about Jesus and from city to city, new churches were started. And then um, he came back and he reported and then he goes back out again and does the same thing, this time with a guy named Silas. And again, just telling people the message of Jesus and it's going to the ends of the earth. Like literally, churches are being started in city one after another and it just continues to grow. It's a beautiful thing when you think about it because um, we're a part of the ends of the earth. We're a part of that aspect of the story. If you ever wonder like, how did we get here? We got here because of this story. Like the ends of the earth includes a church on the South Hill of Spokane, Washington, right? Which is a beautiful thing. So we're, we're seeing our origins, we're, we're understanding um, where we came from, but we're also seeing things about who we are becoming. And that's one of the reasons why each week we dive into the scriptures, is we're looking for places where we can read and see the story of the early church intersecting with our lives. Or we see the, the, the information that the early Christians might have had impacting how they thought or how they behaved. And so um, we're looking at these things and then seeking to have them apply to us. Um, today we moved to a city in, in Acts chapter 17 called Berea. Uh, so Paul was in, in Philippi. He was in 
Thessalonica last week, we looked at that. If you were here, you know that last week sort of ended with a conflict, some rioting in the streets and, and, and a bit of trouble. And so this week we pick up with them traveling to a city called Berea. And there's very specific things that happen in Berea that inform us today. So if you have a Bible with you, if you want to open up to Acts chapter 17, we're going to start reading in verse 10. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen with me. This is what it says. It says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them, therefore, believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. And those who conducted Paul, or those that were traveling with Paul, brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now, um, it doesn't seem like much in this story. You read this, you go, okay, that's kind of interesting. They go to Berea and some people listen. There is something crazy good in this little text that we're looking at today. In fact, um, it is challenging in a very particular way. Let me just kind of paint the picture here. When they leave Thessalonica, they go to this place called Berea. And Berea is a beautiful little town. It's a, um, actually more of a city. It's on the foothills of Mount Olympus in northern Greek. It, there are natural springs all around this particular city. There's a river that runs through it. Kind of sounds familiar, right? Kind of a beautiful place to be. It's like, if you're going to like be exiled to someplace from Thessalonica, you want to go on vacation to Berea, right? So it's a really nice place, really great spot they go to. And when they get there, they do what they've been doing in every single place they go. They go to the synagogue. And they go there because there are people who are understanding the scriptures. They can reason from the scriptures this whole message about Jesus. And so they go to the synagogue just like they've always gone to the synagogue. But then Luke says something that we've never heard before. So in some ways, this looks like everything else. But then we hear something that has never been said at any of the other churches or any other cities that have been visited. He says literally in verse 11, if you look at this, he says that the Jews that were in this place were more noble than those in Thessalonica. This is where this gets really interesting for us. When I hear this, um, it resonates with me on a level that I'm not quite sure I want to admit in front of you know, a few hundred people. Um, like this. Let me just give you this example. Let's say that there was somebody that decided to observe the church in 2017 in the Western United States. And so um, they go around all over, you know, this part of the region, this part of the country, and they're observing, they're writing about the church. And then at some point they write a book and then like everybody gets bored with that book and that person dies. And the book ends up at an estate sale 150 years from now. And somebody's at that estate sale and they find this book about the church in 2017 in the Western United States. And they pull that book out and they start reading. And from chapter to chapter, it's a story of telling about all of these churches up and down the Western coast of this country called the United States. And eventually it comes to this chapter about this particular church in a city called Spokane. And it's on the South Hill and it's called Summit. And what I hope I find is that the people at Summit were noble. More noble than everybody else, right? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? There's like a part of me that's like, man, if that's the description you get, like they're traveling all over. They're like, well, but those Summit people, they were way more noble than everyone else, right? It's kind of an interesting thing that they say this, right? You hear this, you go, okay, I've not heard that one before. But more noble sounds great, especially when it relates to faith-related conversations, when it relates to spirituality or systems that people use to sort of resolve, like, why are we here and what's the universe really all about? Um, And I say that because nobility in that conversation is rare. Those kinds of conversations around faith and spiritual systems and religions, um, typically those conversations are characterized by conflict, by a lack of nobility. Usually those conversations um, can be mudslinging. They can be hateful. They can be very argumentative. And so when I hear that, I think even more so, well, wouldn't it be great if there was a group of people in the context of those sorts of conversations that actually um, lived out their lives a little more nobly than everybody else? Like, we are the noble ones. Sounds good, right? 
it's interesting because when you look at this, you realize um, on the surface, there is a certain dynamic to the use of this word noble that we understand. We hear this and we think of like royalty, right? There's a nobility. There's sort of a positional nobility. They were just maybe a little more educated, a little smarter. Maybe there were just certain things about these people that, that made them more noble. But when you look beneath the surface, you realize there is a deeper meaning to this word noble that, that Luke is using to describe these particular people people here. In fact, the early days, they might have thought of this word in the same way that we do. But by the time he uses it here, this word doesn't mean that these people think of themselves more highly than others. It doesn't think that, mean that they carry themselves more respectfully like royalty. Literally, this word means that they were open-minded. Being more noble, this idea of nobility, is a word that is translated open-mindedness. And so what's being described is a group of people who were more open-minded than the other Jewish individuals. So the Jews in Berea, it says that when somebody showed up in their town, they listened a little more carefully. And they approached sensitive conversations a little more calmly, that they actually heard what was being said. It means that they weren't arrogant or prideful. They didn't think more highly of themselves than they, than they should have. And it turns out that their nobility is derived from, or it comes from, their humility. There's actually a certain humility about these Bereans, which is why they're being called noble. Their nobility comes from their humility. They were humble and open-minded. Sort of a different outlook than the one that we would have on this. What it's saying is that these individuals, they weren't set in their ways. They hadn't drawn all the conclusions about life and God and how to live their life with God. And so they were still open to learning new things. They were willing to listen, to lean in, to discover. And the truth is that when you hear that, my guess is that that is probably even a little more compelling and even a little more attractive than just being considered noble in our cultural sense, isn't it? To be known as a group of people who are patient and listen and lean in and are willing to learn there's something more noble than what we would ever call noble in our culture, isn't there? That's true nobility. In fact, notice again what it says. In verse 11, it says, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word that they were bringing. They received this message with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if it were so. They were eager about this thing. They're hearing some news that they've never heard before. I want you to think about um, just how outlandish this message of a God of grace who has done everything in his power to let his people know that he loves them, who has given his son on a cross. Imagine this whole story of the resurrection of Jesus and just how foreign it would have been to the ears of the hearers. And it says that these individuals listened with an eagerness, like, wait, you mean there's something more we can discover about God? There's a receptivity. There's a, a willingness to hear them out. And hearing that really makes sense of this idea of nobility. I mean, imagine this. Imagine that you yourself um, begin to make observations or start to um, think about spirituality or religion or philosophy. And let's say that as you sort of on your own individual journey, you start drawing conclusions and you begin to write things. Maybe you have a journal and you begin to consider things and you start to formulate paragraphs. And pretty soon you have this idea of, could it be that the story that's being told to humanity is this sort of thing? Could it be that this is the way we understand God? Imagine doing that and then imagine reaching a particular point where you say, I think it would be healthy or good for me to go to other people and see what they think about this. And so you take this new idea that, maybe no one's ever heard of, this new thing that there's no category for, and you sit with somebody and you say, hey, let me just tell you what I've been thinking. Imagine if that person looks at you and says, this is absolute idiocy, right? I cannot believe you've drawn these sorts of conclusions. In fact, this would erode everything we know to be true. Like, how in the world could you ever consider these things? Shame on you, shame on you. Like, they're just judgment and shame for thinking in this sort of way, right? And they just sort of dump on you, rain on your parade, And they say, this is absolutely like, you're you're wrong on so many levels. Now imagine like you get done with that conversation and you you pull yourself up and you say, you know what, I'm going to go to somebody else. And so you go to another person and you sit down with that person and you share the very same things. But instead of this person jumping all over you, they listen and they consider and they think. They say, you know, I'm not sure about that. And how'd you come to this conclusion? Can I ask you some questions? And what if they said to you, maybe we'll get back, can I get back to you like in a couple of days? I want to think about this a little bit. And they come back to you 
It, even if they came back to you and disagreed with you, what if they even came back to you and they agreed more with the other person than they do with you? Wouldn't you consider that person more noble for listening and considering and walking in a particular way? See, their no- nobility isn't related to them being right or wrong. Their nobility is associated with the manner in which they carried themselves, the way that they lived this thing out. It's in the the manner in which they acted. There's this humility about them. That's what characterizes this group. They were humble. They were more noble because they listened. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? But what causes them to be humble? Where would this come from? I think this is a very interesting thing. It takes a very secure sort of person to not get defensive. It takes a very secure sort of person to not just have to pounce on somebody's ideas that aren't our own ideas, right? It takes a very different kind of person. So why in the world um, would these people have responded this way? How could they be so humble and so open? The, The answer to that question is actually the second half of verse 11 when you look at this. It says, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. We now know this. There was an eagerness to listen, but then listen to this. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Notice the second part of this. They examined the scriptures. Now, why is this important and what is this really telling us about these people? In fact, um, not just what is it telling us about them, but what could this be telling us about us? How would this contribute to their humble nobility? When you think about it this way, they hear this news of Jesus. They hear this news that is brand new. It's nothing that they've ever heard before. This is um, somewhat outlandish. And it says that when they hear this news of a God of grace and a God of love, who's gone to all this effort to communicate it to these people, it says they examined the scriptures, which reveals something about where these people found or identified with truth. Where did they find truth? See, their humility was the result of them finding truth not within their own intellect, not within their own hearts, but with them finding truth outside of themselves. That's why they're humble. Because their source of truth isn't their own thinking. Their source of truth is the scriptures. They are submitted to something other than themselves. The the, the final word on what's right or wrong isn't left to their thinking or to their logical conclusions. Ultimate truth is not something they insisted they had discovered and cornered the truth on. You see this? Like it's when they come with an idea that's different than what they've understood. For them, that person isn't coming against them because they were the ones that held truth. That person is coming against another truth that they hold. They're, They're coming and so they reflect on this particular thing. They trusted something outside of themselves and it is this thing referred to as the scriptures. They were humble because they were submitted to the scriptures. That's what humbled them. So that when they hear these things, they're not defensive, right? They're not defensive because this isn't my thing. Like this is God's thing. Like we have these scriptures and that's actually where we find truth. And so even though this thing, you might, I don't really see this. I'm not going to take it personally because personally isn't where I have derived my truth from or where my, I've derived my meaning from. We've derived our meaning from over here, which allows them to then say, well, let's see what the scriptures say about what you're bringing to me. And there's something beautiful in what happens here. They find truth apart from themselves. They find it in the scriptures. And again, there's this nobility, right? And we see this. When somebody responds humbly and calmly, it is a reflection of the reality that they already know that they can be wrong. Isn't it refreshing when you meet somebody and they can admit they're wrong? I mean, think about this. Like, I'm... Don't you, like when when you bring an idea to somebody or you talk to somebody, you ask someone a question, maybe it's about your career, maybe it's about your education, maybe it's around spirituality. Isn't there something that happens inside of you? When you ask somebody a question and they don't answer you immediately, instead they pause and they think and they even say things like, you know, can I get back to you on this? Isn't there something that happens in you where you're like, As much as I really want you to answer me right now, I actually respect you more for not thinking you have an immediate answer to whatever is in front of you. There's a nobility to that. That's what I love about the Bereans. That's what I love to be true of us. 
that they trusted something outside of themselves so much more that they couldn't give an immediate answer to Paul and Silas. They had to go examine the scriptures. They trusted it more than they trusted themselves. They knew things that we know when we're honest, right? When we're honest about ourselves, we know the very same sort of thing that would have driven this behavior in them. Like, we know that our feelings can get in the way of logic. Amen? Like, isn't that true? Like, we know this, that our emotions have the ability to override our logic. Or am I the only one in the room that this is true of, right? Like, or our physiology, right? Our physiology can override our logic, can override our thinking. Let me give you one example. Most of us in the room know what the word hangry means, right? How many of you know this word personally? How many of you have experienced it from somebody else, right? I mean, what is this? Hangry is this example that our physiology, just because we need to put food in our belly, we can actually be impatient with people. We can be angry. We can actually do things, say things that later we have to come back to people and say, I am so sorry. I had a Snickers bar and now I just feel better, right? Like, (laughs) and which like you lose so much credibility in that moment, right? When you're like, seriously, you yelled at me because you were hungry. Awesome, right? But we've done this, right? We've done this because our physiology, our emotions, our feelings can override our intellect. Sometimes we don't even have the right information to make the right decision at the time, and yet we move forward. Um, How many of you have asked yourself this question? At some point or another, you've said to yourself, what was I thinking? Raise your hand if that's you. Be honest, you're in church, okay? (laughs) Don't, Don't mess around now, right? Like, And what does that mean? That means that at some point, maybe it was the day after, maybe it was the year after, you look back and you scratch your head and it's some decision you made that you, I mean, how many times you thought it was a good decision, right? You thought it was a well-informed decision. You had logic your way through it. You did the pros and the cons. And somehow you still find yourself a year later saying, what in the world was I thinking? See, all of these things reveal this word called fallibility. We are fallible. We make mistakes because of emotions, because of physiology, because of incomplete logic. You and I can make decisions that we regret later. We don't always think perfectly about everything, which is why what the Bereans are modeling for us is so beautiful, because they're locating truth outside of those emotions and outside of the logic and outside of the physiology. They're locating truth in a place that can actually be depended on, and it's the scriptures That's what's happening here. They knew themselves, and so they leaned on something else. Which is why I want to take the last few minutes this morning and and talk about what it was they were leaning on. It says they leaned on the scriptures. They went to the scriptures to figure out if this thing was true or not. And I think that's interesting, especially in our culture today, because there there are people today, and even Christians today, that sort of look at the scriptures and they consider them a bit outdated, right? Like, the stories are a little too barbaric for our culture, or maybe there's just a little too much fairy tale, like, you know, pixie dust being sprinkled in the stories of scripture, or, um, or maybe it's just not really relevant today. And yet at the same time, when I read the scriptures, throwing it out that way would be us throwing out ideas that are so progressive that we're still trying to figure out how to live them out today. I mean, the Bible is so progressive on on gender equality that we still haven't figured this one out. And the Bible is so progressive as it relates to racism. We're still trying to figure out the values that it presents to us. So progressive as it relates to injustice and economic inequality. I mean, there are so many ideas in Scripture that are far more progressive than our culture. And so to throw it out wholesale would be an incredible mistake for us. We're still figuring this thing out. Yet at the same time, I think we all can say that we've known somebody who has viewed scripture so rigidly and through some specific framework that is so tight that they've abused people with the Bible or um, they've fenced people in, they've condemned people, and they've just produced guilt and judgment and shame out of it. And so the question is like, so what do we do with this? These people leaned on the scriptures, but why? What did they know about the scriptures and how did they view the scriptures that might allow us to to view them the same way and to behave in the same way. So I want to talk about three very quick things that um, the Bible says about itself. I think that's an interesting place to start, that um, if you wanted to know me, I would prefer you let me tell you about me. Um, I think we should let the Bible tell us about itself. And so just three real simple ideas that I want to unpack. If you're taking notes, maybe jot some of these down. 
One of the first things we see is that the Bible refers to itself as the Word of God. This idea of it being the Word of God, which that's a very familiar term for those of us around church, but do we understand what's being said? Um, The word, word, or the word for word, or the word for um, speaking in Hebrew is the word devar. Uh, Devar is this this word we see in the Bible 1,400 times. The word devar is to speak. They devour. Devour is this idea of speaking. But what's interesting is among these 1,400 references, not only is it used to describe speaking or words coming out of a person's mouth, but it's also identified as a, a thing, like an idea. Devar is, um, is something that we experience. It's something that we feel. It's something we can see. It's something we can touch. And so in this one Hebrew word, devar, there are two concepts joined together. There is this idea of words being spoken and things happening together, like words result in something being created, something taking place. There is speaking, and through that speaking, something comes into existence that you and I can experience. So the writers of the Bible, what they understood was that behind all of this life that we're living, the origins behind us, that there was some sort of source behind where we are living and what we're doing in this world. And what they believed is that this source, this being, this God would speak speak and would speak things into being that would literally be something we could experience, that the words spoke life and creation. The words would speak and there was power and things would change. They believed that this God was speaking things that was changing things. And so the word of God is literally this idea that, that it, is, it is text, this collection of poems and histories and, and stories are, are things that when God speaks them, they're things that happen. Which might explain why sometimes you and I will have an encounter with the scriptures and listening to the words on the pages of the Bible are just somehow different than listening to the words of somebody else. Because that's the word, it's the spoken word of God. Things are coming into reality. There is power with the spoken word of God. So that's one of the references. A second one is that the scriptures refer to themselves as having authority. And this is sort of an interesting one, and I think even challenging in our culture, because none of us really like authority. Um, Case in point, the IRS, right? No one likes the IRS, right? Even accountants don't like the IRS. I can just tell you that from experience, right? The IRS, like, so, so we don't like authority that is positional authority over us. Governments have authority over us. Um, law enforcement has authority over us positionally. No one just willingly submits to law enforcement. Let me just sh- show you how. Like, when was the last time you heard about somebody who sped past a distracted officer and then pulled over and said, hey, I was going 15 over? said no one never, right? Like there's no one that would ever do that sort of thing. We only submit to that authority positionally when we're forced to do those sorts of things, right? Um, That's what authority tends to be thought of in our culture. It's the authority of bosses. It's the authority of kings. It's the authority of, of leaders. But when we look at the concept or the idea of biblical authority, there's a different nuance to this. It isn't the same sort of way. So when the Bible talks about having authority, it's not just positional authority. You do what I tell you to do. In fact, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he's writing to this church that we're going to see in Acts chapter 18 in two weeks. Um, He's writing and he tells them about the authority. He uses the word authority. He tells them about the authority that God has given him for building them up and not tearing them down. Like God has given me authority to build you up and not tear you down. And the word that Paul uses in the Greek language is the Greek word exousia. Say that with me. Just say exousia. There you go. You all spoke Greek today. So exousia is made up of two words. There's like two roots that are being combined here in this word. The first word is ek, which means out from. And the second word is amy, which um, gets translated to exousia, I know, in a very complicated way as it's conjugated. But that word means to be. So out from, to be, exousia is this word authority. There is this coming out from something in order to be something. That is what exousia is. So God has allowed me to come out with something to be something or to allow you to be something. That is the idea of exousia. Um, Oftentimes this word exousia in Greek language, it's translated to weight. 
There's a weight. There's like a force. There's something that you can feel. Um, it's, it's considered power. It's translated influence. That there is exousia. There is influence. It's um, something coming out of in order to be something, in order to become something. It's something you have, but it's also a dynamic sense of having it in order for something to be done. So the Bible has authority. It comes out of so that we could be something. It isn't just positional authority. Just do what we're telling you to do. It's a different kind of authority. It's a relational authority. Um, Sherry and I, we, we don't particularly love debt. I know some people do. Um, they must, right? I, we just don't love debt. And so um, we, because of that, we try to pay cash for our cars, which means that we really drive old cars all the time. That's basically what that equates to, which means this. It means we drive cars where those warning lights on the dash are regularly on. You know those check engine, you know, soon light, all those, all those things that like flash on the dash? Um, let me just tell you a little information. You can drive way longer with those on than you think you can. <laughs> We've learned this. In fact, in our house, we just ignore the Christmas tree on the dash. Just like, guys, don't pay attention. I'm always telling my girls, don't pay attention to that. The only things you need to pay attention to are things you can smell and things you can hear. That's it. <laughs> and it's true. But the problem is in our family, you know, like, no matter where we're going, everyone's like, you guys smell that? I smell that. Is that bad? I think that's okay. I don't think that's oil. I think that's the paper mill down the road, right? That's, that's like on vacations. We're always smelling or we hear things. Did you hear that? And like, it was just something we ran over. Are you sure? It might've been a wheel coming off, but I think we'd know by now, right? <laughs> so it's just things you can smell and things you can hear that's better than the things on the dash. Now, that being said, because we drive older cars, occasionally we smell things or hear things that you shouldn't smell or hear while driving a car. And the good news is I have a friend who is a mechanic. My friend who's a mechanic is, um, he is brilliant. He is so good at what he does that sometimes he can smell my car from like a mile away, right? (laughs) I'm not kidding. Like he can hear it making noises as I'm pulling into the parking lot. And you know those instruments that mechanics have, all these expensive things that they plug into your car that diagnose? I, I promise you, the only reason he uses these things is to prove to me that he was right. That's it. That's the only reason. Because he will get in my car. Sometimes in 10 seconds, he'll go, oh, there's these three things. And then he plugs this thing in and he goes, see? Like every time, this is the way this thing goes down. So what happens when he does that? I give him exousia over my car, right? I give him authority. He has the power to do something to make it Right. That's the idea of authority. There's this understanding, this relational understanding that says you have a way of looking at this that's so different than I do. And I'm going to allow you to let it become what it's intended to become because of what you know. Biblical authority is defined this way. It has power and influence and we give it that power and influence. It has authority over us. It doesn't mean that we just simply blindly accept everything. That's what I love about the Bereans, and I love this story, is that there are people who heard great ideas, and there was this open-mindedness, but then at the same time, they said, well, let's talk about this. Is it really true? What do we think about this? Why would we agree to this? Prove it to me. I love the wrestling of the Bereans. I love the honesty, even maybe the potential skepticism that they carried with them as they approached new ideas and wrestled with the scriptures. But the scriptures had authority to speak over their emotions, their physiology, even their thinking. And then the third and final thing the Bible says about itself is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It's interesting. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. If you're reading this in Greek, There's a word that gets used here by Paul that doesn't get used anywhere else in the New Testament. In fact, it says all scripture is theonoustos. That's the word. All scripture is theonoustos and is useful for teaching and reproof and correcting and training. Theonoustos. That's two words that form a conjunction that is never used anywhere else in the Bible. Theonoustos. Theo means God, and noustos means breath. It is the breath of God. Scripture is the breath, the breathing of God. Now, with this, um, this word, when you understand the word theo, you know that's God. When you understand noustos, this word that's being used for 
for breath, it's associated with the Greek word pneuma. Pneuma is not just the breath, but pneuma is also the same word used to describe the spirit. In, in the Hebrew language, um, the word ruach was used to describe the breath of a person. Ruach is breath, but ruach is also spirit. There is something beyond just breathing. In Latin language, there is the word spire. Spire in Latin means to breathe, but it also means the spirit of something, that it's breathing, but there is life associated to this, right? Which is why when somebody expires, expires, it means they stopped breathing. But it means more than just stopping to breathe. It means that in this moment, they stopped living. Their spirit was taken from them. So in all cultures everywhere, there has been this close association of breathing, like the physical action of breathing, and also this understanding of life, like there is a spirit about something. And we use this sort of language to describe other things, right? Like um, some organizations have uh, a characteristic, an ethos about them, a spirit about them. Some teams have a certain spirit, right? That's why we call it team spirit, right? There's a certain thing about them, a characteristic about them. There is this theonoustos, the God-breathed aspect of Scripture that doesn't just speak to the fact that these are words on a page, but there's something more than this. There's something more than just black and white on pieces of paper, but there is the Spirit to something. God breathes them, but there is life in them. Kind of a, a simplistic example of this would be in music, where how many times do you hear a particular song and that song inspires something in you? Has anybody ever experienced that? You listen to something and it maybe reminds you of a particular time or takes you to a certain place or you feel certain emotions. Um, lately for me, there's this one particular track that I've been listening to. Like every week I'll sort of come to it and it just does something to me. Like takes you, I call it transporting. It like transports me someplace, you know? Um, it's this track, it's a song that Stan Getz recorded Uh, who's a jazz musician, and he covered a Chick Corea song that's called Crystal, um, or what is it called? Crystal Silence. And it's this, on this album from 1972, and I discovered it this one particular day, and I heard it, and I was like, man, this is like this amazing, just beautiful song. So I listened to it, and it transforms me. There's something in this Stan Getz version of Crystal Silence. Something more than this. isn't it amazing? I mean, can't you feel it right now? Like the spirit of this just moving and don't you, no, right? This is fairly flat, right? There doesn't, I mean, especially if you can't read music like me, right? I just look at this. I'm like, yeah, that's great. If you know what that gibberish is talking about, right? But it doesn't mean anything, right? If it's just words on a page, that's just, just the words on the page. But there is a spirit to this when it's played out. That's what Paul says the scriptures are like. They are God-breathed, which means there is life in these words. There is truth in these words. There is something we experience as we hear them and listen to them that's different than any other sort of text. It's beautiful, and it's good, and it makes sense of the Bereans and their experience, doesn't it? That they were encountering the scriptures in a way that was unique. They saw them for what they presented themselves to be, that these were the words of God, that there were power, power being spoken, and there were things that existed just in, in reading these things. They understood that there was this authority, that it, it talked about things beyond the scope of our own rational minds, and they, they, they grasped this experience of it being God-breathed, like God is moving and there's something dynamic happening in this. And so obviously they would be open to new things, but they would examine the scriptures and then believe. They would see what God is doing. It really begs us a question, doesn't it? Do we locate truth within our own minds and our own emotions, our own physiology? Or are you and I locating truth outside of those things. And when we do locate truth, what kinds of things are we depending on? Are we locating truth in something that is literally theonoustos? Are we locating truth in something that has relational authority? Are we locating that truth in ideas and words that bring things into existence that don't exist without them? That's the Bereans. 
They looked at the scriptures and it reminded them that there's a God who's for them and loves them. They looked at the scriptures full of stories of people who are fallible, just like you and I, who did amazing, beautiful, good things in the world because they were led by these truths. They received the word with eagerness. They examined the scriptures and they believed. I think one of the most compelling reasons for me to find myself submitting to the scriptures and locating truth in this place is that they present a God who, unlike any other God in any other time, proves his love for us through sacrificial love. A God who humbles himself. And as that God humbles himself and shows his love, even when I don't believe the way he wants me to believe or act the way he wants me to act, even in those moments, it compels me to say, that's the kind of God I could actually locate truth in rather than myself. That's the invitation the Bereans present to us. Will we trust God more than we trust ourselves? And it's a beautiful thing. Would you stand with me? And let's pray together. Lord, I I, I just strongly sense that everything about what the Bereans believed is the exact opposite of the message that our culture sends us. Our culture tells us that we will find our identity in ourselves. Our culture says that we'll find our, our identity in what we think and what we feel, what our bodies say. And yet... This says that we find our identity in a completely different place and ultimately find our identity in you. Lord, as we struggle with this, as we um, wrestle with the tension of how we live this out, as we um, give up final say in moments when we just want to go an opposite direction, Lord, would you give us courage and strength? Would you let us experience the power of your word being spoken? the authority that we know has weight, the breathing of life. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's close by singing together this morning. A couple of things before you go today. Um, The first one I'll mention is this, that, um, you know, if you want to talk with somebody, you need some truth that's outside of yourself. Uh, Pray with someone. There's folks that are available after the service down front. Second thing is that today um, we've got our Advent study. I know Grant mentioned this earlier today, but our Advent study, which is a great way for you to begin to just let the scriptures speak to your life. It's free. They're on some of the tables in the back. They're at the resource center. It's a great way to just spend some time thinking about what God says as we head into the Christmas season. So um, with that, today as you go, may you be more noble than the rest. (laughs) May you be humble. May you examine the scriptures and may you believe. Amen. Amen. Love you guys so much. Next week, Paul in Athens. It's a great passage. We're looking forward to it. See you guys next Sunday.